So the story of Bitcoin actually begins in the Middle Ages, might be surprised, uh, with robbers on the road to Jerusalem. And yes, I did do these drawings, by the way. So, um, so if you're among the pious and you were well off in the Middle Ages, you would go to the Holy Land um, the, via this road to Jerusalem, um, bringing gold with you typically so you could give it at the temple. Problem was, most of the time you would arrive in Jerusalem, your bag of gold would be gone because the robbers would get it from you on the road, right? So the Knights Templar were the ones who were in charge of protecting the road to Jerusalem, and so they had this problem. They came up with a clever solution. Um, see, the Knights Templar also used a code to communicate uh, with each other, and it was a code that was very difficult uh, to learn, and it was a secret that they guarded and kept uh, well hidden from the public. So they decided to say to uh, people that were going to Jerusalem and Europe, come, give us your gold, we'll take it from you, we'll put it in a little back room, We'll write something down on a little piece of paper. It'll be in code. We'll give it to you. You then take this piece of paper with you to Jerusalem and find a Templar on the other side, give them this piece of paper. Um, they would then take it from you in Jerusalem, go in the back and bring out the same amount of gold. Um, so in that one instance, the Templars invented modern banking and also invented cryptocurrency. Because when you had that piece of paper and you were traveling on the road to Jerusalem, your store of value was encrypted, it was, it was, but the store of value was a code that you had on a piece of paper. So cryptocurrency and, oops, I think this way. Cryptocurrency and modern banking were born at the same moment. In many ways, they are twins. Okay, so that brings us to the modern cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Um, so what is it? Well, it's, the easiest way to explain it is it's internet cash, and it has the characteristics of cash. And by that, I mean um, it specifically exists in one place. So typically, Bitcoins are stored on a device, right, like a computer or a, or a mobile phone, something like that. Um, but also, if you lose your computer or it crashes, you've lost your Bitcoins. So it's very unlike, you know, if you have a bank account somewhere, it's safe. Um, it's, it, it's like cash in that it can be destroyed if it's in one place. Um, the other thing that's cash-like about it is it's anonymous. So for example, if I want to buy that iPad, I don't have to know your name. You don't have to know my name. All you have to know is that I've got the correct amount of cash and we do, we do a transaction, and I walk away with my iPad, and you know, we're both happy. Um, very much unlike PayPal. PayPal, you have to know someone's email address, right? You, you, so there is some identifying, um, you, you basically, you, it's not anonymous. So um, the way it works in the Bitcoin universe, uh, in terms of uh, what your address is, you have a Bitcoin, you're, you use a wallet to basically, um, to do your Bitcoin transactions. Um, so basically, the burner, it's sort of like a burner phone, right? In that your email address, uh, sorry, the address is something which is disposable. So, um, so anyway, so there's no, so the, the address is disposable. You can go and um, generate a new one, but it is anonymous. So um, once you've used the address, um, if, you are, if you are associated with it, you basically, um, you won't, uh, you lose your anonymity, basically, when you, when you use it. Um, oh, and it's, oh, pardon me. And it is legal in California, so <laughs> thank you. So, um, so the state of California recently um, made Bitcoin a legal tender. It, has a, it is equivalent to money. Um, so it's actually something which you can use to pay your taxes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what is the import of Bitcoin? Well, it means that you can transact with anyone, anywhere, instantly. Anywhere in the world. There are no third parties. Um, there are no, you have no banks. Oh, sorry. You no longer need banks. So let's think about this for a second. When you pay a bank, when you, you, when you get money out of a bank, right, at an ATM, you have to pay a fee. Why are we paying these fees? We don't have a choice. The banking system basically has a, computer network where the transmission of value um, occurs, and we have to use it. Bitcoin now provides for the very first time transmission of value instantly across the globe, and you don't have to pay these fees. So there are no chargebacks, and if you're a merchant, there are no chargebacks. That's the other thing that's really great. Um, it's very risky taking credit cards around the world uh, in certain countries. Um, if you can basically, because Bitcoin is a cash-like transaction, you never have to run the risk of there being a chargeback. Um, Mark Andreessen said recently that Uber was software eating taxis. <laughs> Bitcoin is software eating banks and money. 
and changing the actual nature of money itself. And this is really important, especially for the unbanked and in the develop developing world. So there's two camps. Um, first one, Bitcoin is awesome. Mark Andreessen, who I was just talking about, he's the guy who invented the web browser. Now he says that Bitcoin is the most important invention since the internet itself. Um, so he's obviously a huge fan. Then you have the people who think Bitcoin is evil, right? So Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of, J of JP Morgan, um, says it's a terrible store of value. Uh, Warren Buffett says nothing backs it. Other people have said it's a Ponzi scheme. Um, and then a lot of people associate it with sort of dirty business like drugs and, um, you know, because there was, a, there was a site called uh, Silk Road where people basically used Bitcoin to pay for uh, drugs and things like that, um, which went out of business. So you, have, you really have two, two camps on this. So who controls it? Nobody controls it. It's an open protocol like the internet itself. So um, there's no one company. It's a stateless currency. Uh, and there's no president of Bitcoin. So what backs Bitcoin? The mathematical laws that are baked into the very fabric of the universe are what back Bitcoin. <laughs> right? not, not Neil deGrasse Tyson, but, and by that I mean specifically encryption, right? So um, in, there's, money is usually backed by a, uh, an army somewhere or gold somewhere, right? Here it's backed by math. So if a country, if a country ceases to exist um, or the gold is lost, it, 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 for, for Bitcoin it doesn't matter. So, the blockchain, you probably heard this term if you've heard of Bitcoin, is really the, the invention of the blockchain is what makes Bitcoin possible. It's sort of the flux capacitor, if you will. Um, what it is, in essence, is a peer-to-peer -peer public ledger, um, and it's transparent. And this is really the key innovation. Um, so when I say it's transparent, I mean anyone can go look at all Bitcoin transactions. Um, they are anonymized, so you don't know who is moving the, the money around, but you can see every single transaction in the Bitcoin universe. So let's talk about stores of value, something Jamie Dimon likes to talk about. So why do we use gold? Well, first of all, it's rare. Um, it's very, very heavy, so it's almost impossible to fake. Um, it's, easy, it's a soft metal, so it's easily divisible. Um, the minuses are you have to dig a hole in the ground and find it, because it's difficult to find. Then you dig another hole in the ground and put your gold in it, and then you have to guard it, right? Um, <laughs> it's heavy, so it's hard to move. Um, and uh, there's no transparency. So people do transactions with gold. There's no record of it anywhere necessarily. So let's talk about Bitcoin versus gold. So it too is rare. There's only 12 million Bitcoins uh, right now in existence. There will only ever be 21, bit, 21 million Bitcoins. Um, it cannot be forged. The, crypt the cryptography behind it is very secure. Um, and some of the best minds in cryptography or sorry, some of the best minds in the world have actually tried to break Bitcoin and have found it to be unbreakable. Um, it is also easily divisible. Um, each Bitcoin, by the way, you can, right now each Bitcoin is worth about 600 bucks. Some people are like, oh, I can't afford to buy a Bitcoin because I don't have $600. Um, you can buy any amount of Bitcoin. Um, in fact, there are, there's 100 million bit pennies, if you will, and they call them Satoshis, um, in each Bitcoin. So it's very, very, very divisible. Uh, as you might expect being a digital currency. Um, the bonuses are that it's easy to store, um, and also it moves instantly with no fees, as I said earlier before. So let's talk about the dollar. Um, well, the Federal Reserve issues it, right? Um, and they issue it electronically. This is something a lot of people don't know. Typically, um, there's only 8% of dollars are ever printed. The rest of the dollars that you use and you transact with are, um, are purely electronic. They don't actually, there's no Scrooge McDuck vault somewhere with you know, a big pile of cash in it, right? So um, do, the dollar has lost 98% of its value since 1913, since, basically since the Federal Reserve took over. Uh, between the years of 1776 and 1912, um, the dollar was, it was pretty much even. It didn't lose any value at all. Since 1913, it's basically gone downhill. Um, but Bitcoin, which has existed now since 2008, um, has 10x in value every single year. So a pretty good store of value, actually, in comparison. Also because um, there are only 12 million Bitcoins and there will only ever be 21 million, um, it is essentially immune to inflation. So how are new Bitcoins born? Um, well, so basically everyone, the, the network is, is made up of essentially volunteer computers, right? Um, somebody has to do the electronic janitor work of, of validating transactions in the Bitcoin network. Um, these people are called miners. And so 
what happens is, is the, uh, it's, if you, I don't know if you recall um, SETI at Home. It was basically a program where you ran a screensaver on your computer that would actually analyze some of the SETI uh, uh, data and send it back to NASA. I think it was NASA anyway. Um, this is much the same thing. So your computer is actually doing the work of the Bitcoin network if you are one of these people who are the miners. Why would you do that? Well, because every 10 minutes or so, 25 new Bitcoins are given out essentially at random to the miners. So you are essentially rewarded for being the electronic janitor in the system. Um, so, and, the, and there is no way to speed this up, this process up. There will, it's 25, it's just like clockwork, every 10 minutes, 25 new Bitcoins are made. Um, and it's actually gonna have, at the end of next year, 12 uh, Bitcoins every 10 minutes. So the rate is decreasing. So there is no, so something like TARP, where the Federal Reserve just printed up a bunch of money, would not be possible in the Bitcoin universe. Um, it's mathematically locked and loaded, there is no way to change it. The other thing that's interesting about this is it makes you the Federal Reserve. A lot of people are like, well, there has to be someone who um, issues this currency, and the answer is everyone issues it. It democratizes the minting of currency. So where is your Bitcoin? Where is it physically located? Um, and I lied slightly earlier when I said that it was actually on something, um, like on a computer. An actual Bitcoin is nothing more than a 32-digit uh, code, and it's an encryption code. Um, typically, that code is stored in your Bitcoin wallet on your machine, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and that is really, the, that code gives you permission to spend a certain amount of Bitcoin. That's all it does. The public ledger is actually, the, the big, hmm, the public ledger is where um, the amount of Bitcoin you're allowed to spend is uh, recorded. This key unlocks that uh, ability to spend in the blockchain. That's all it does. So what's interesting about that is you could actually, if you memorized your key, you could have your Bitcoin nowhere else other than your mind. So you could literally have millions of dollars stored in your brain, especially if you, if you deleted your wallet on all the, all the other devices. It would be the only place it would exist would be in your mind. So, um, one of the things you like, we like in our currency is resiliency. Um, fairly recently, a place called Mt. Gox um, was the largest Bitcoin exchange in the world, went under. Um, it, which, so a lot of people thought Bitcoin went bankrupt. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, it's a, it was just a poorly managed bank. It really says nothing about you know, whether a current, the currency that they managed was worthwhile or not. Um, so Mt. Gox went under. Um, at the same time, almost about a week later, this was not in the news um, too much, the largest botnet attack in the internet's history occurred. So, um, so basically you had uh, the largest cyber attack in, in history and the collapse of the major exchange um, for Bitcoin. And, Bit and the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin survived. Not only did it survive, it actually did pretty well. It lost about half of its value. So it was at about 1,200 and it came down to 600. Um, in terms of its uh, value, but it wasn't destroyed. That's actually, I, I view that as actually a huge positive. I don't, I'm not aware of another currency that could survive the death of its largest exchange and have uh, and such a, uh, a huge um, cyber attack all at once. So the state of uh, Bitcoin today, there's one million wallets in the world. Um, it's very much like the internet was in uh, 1994. <coughs> That's really where Bitcoin is at the moment. Um, so my advice to you all is go out, get a Bitcoin wallet, and buy some Bitcoin. $600 is probably still pretty cheap. If this grows like the internet did, if it sort of follows the same trajectory, um, you know, only one million people are using Bitcoin right now. If two billion people are using it in, say, 10 years, the value of Bitcoin will go up quite a bit between now and then. Nobody knows yet whether this is gonna be the, the, the MySpace, if you will, of cryptocurrency, <laughs> but uh, some, something, some other cryptocurrency could come along, but I don't think there's very much doubt in a lot of people's minds that um, cryptocurrency will be how money is handled um, in the future, and by that I mean the near future, a couple of years from now. Um, and it's already moving very quickly right now. But really, Bitcoin, for me, is not really about the technology, it's about hope. Um, it democratizes the minting of currency. Um, it's a chance for us to um, really rethink money in the financial system in a way that benefits most people. So um, I think it's an idea worth spreading.